Shalom and welcome to another edition of Our Daily Bread, where we discuss the weekly Torah portion. This week's parashat is called Toldot, and it is the sixth parashat of the book of Bereshit, also called Genesis, and it is called Toldot, which means generation. And this year 2011-12, my message for this parashat is called A Man Has Two Sons. Now, um... We're going to get into a little bit of a conceptual understanding here, so you're going to have to grab a hold of the rope and hold on. Uh, I may or may not be able to explain it all uh, in a short message, but uh, I think you'll find uh, it very interesting. Um, one of the things, this is a very interesting parashat because we get into the story of Esau uh, and Jacob, Esau and Jacob, Esau and, and Yaakov, and what we get is we get to this thing that kind of, should cause people to have a question and say, wait, what is this about? Because it seems like uh, Yaakov um, deceives his father. How does he get a blessing out of that? How is Israel formed out of this, which seems like to be something negative, and how can a blessing be honored um, if something was gotten from a deception or something like this? And and that should cause some, some kind of red flags to go up. And what I think we have here is we have a parable that is hard to understand. Um, Kind of like eat my flesh, drink my blood. Uh, when Mashiach said that, uh, he lost some disciples because they found it difficult to reconcile how that would work with, within the Torah. But what you find is is that when things are difficult and you observe them more closely, um, it takes a little more study to find out how does it work and are we understanding it correctly and, and uh, putting it together in the right way uh, to, to understand how it lines up with Torah. And so with this, what we see is the concept of a man has two sons is this concept that it's really about one son and and the path that that son takes. It's the tree of good and evil. It's the fact that we can, we're presented with choice, freedom of our choice. And through this choice, we can either be a son of Elohim or we can be a son of Satan, which essentially encompasses those who are not a son of Elohim. And we see this in the parable of the wheat and the tares. We see that there's two fathers, essentially, and there's two sets of children. There's the children of the devil and the children of Elohim. And in the end, they're going to be sorted out. And what this shows in this parasha, and what we see in other things, uh, Isaiah 56, that's a good read for you to uh, check out. It essentially says those, even the stranger who takes hold of, uh, who, who's not part of Israel who takes hold of his covenant, keeps from polluting the Sabbath, and does things that please him. It says she'll get a name better than sons and daughters. Now, this is a very interesting thing because, you know, first of all, what it says is basically the children are supposed to do the will of their father. But if somebody else comes along and does that will of the father, even though they weren't child, they're going to get a better name than those children because really they were, uh, you know, they, there was no need for them to do that. And in some ways, it might have even been more difficult for them. And there was no expectation for them to do it. So now you get into the reasoning behind why somebody keeps the Torah and stuff like that. And in many ways, what we'll see is we'll see that this is going to provoke the sons and daughters probably to a little bit of jealousy. And, and so you get the parable of the uh, prodigal son in a way uh, overlaying that the one that was always with the father um, being upset when all this uh, was done with the one that had gone astray and then had come back and, and start serving the father. It's a similar type of pattern. And what we see here is that we start off with this concept of a father's uh, disappointment. And the father's uh, disappointment is really about um, it's about action and, and taking on um, this this concept. First of all, he has. We start off with Yitzhak having no sons, okay, and and then Yodewahe opens up Rivka's womb, and she has twins. But the tough thing is, is that these twins they're they're not the same. One they're totally different. Like Cain and Havel, they're totally different, right? It says about Esau that he was a um, a hunter, a man of the field. Uh, and it said that Yaakov was perfect, it said, a man who dwelling in tents. 
And so what you see here is a pattern of an inside and an outside man. Uh, Asav was a man out in the wild in the field hunting, and Yaakov was a man dwelt inside. So an inward and an outward man. And this teaches us a pattern and ties together a lot of uh, teachings of Mashiach in the New Testament about the inside of the cup versus the outside of the cup. And, and you'll know a tree by its fruit. Those two parables are going to be really relevant in this parashon. So what we see is we see that that you have this argument, this situation, this overlying pattern in this story that Esau is the firstborn. He had the inheritance, he had the birth, birthright, and he would get the blessing. Um, and it was and it was kind of um, assumed he would have that blessing at the end of the day because he was the firstborn. But we know that at the end of the story, it doesn't work out that way. And it starts off with the fact that he sold his birthright over a bowl of food. And, and the bowl of food represents the momentary pleasure and ultimately sin. It's to fulfill our momentary desires. It's very similar to Hava, who ate from the tree. It was, it was another example where they were kicked out of the garden um, because of something they ate, which was just a momentary experience that they enjoyed at the cost of something much greater. And um, we see this uh, even with the anger of Cain when he slew his brother for a momentary filling, even out of anger of, of, of revenge um, for the disappointment that he had that his offering wasn't accepted. Um, and because of that, he was cast out. And you see that this there's just this repeating pattern of this going on and on. And it really teaches about self-discipline. And the father's disappointment, concept of the father's disappointment, is to see that, oh, wow, here they chose, just like Hava, chose to eat the fruit instead of obeying God. And how disappointing that would be. Um, and in the same way, Esau sold his birthright. How would that make Yitzhak feel? Um, that his firstborn son, the beginning of his strength, valued his position as the firstborn son to Yitzhak so little that he sold it for a bowl of porridge. Um, you know, we, a lot of times we don't take into account those, those things and how they impact other people and what that means. And so we get to this concept where uh, we're responsible for our actions. Uh, we, a son determines, it's like a man has really one son. Because the son, like Mashiach says, not my will, but thy will. A son is defined as a builder of the name. Name in the Hebrew is uh, the word benah for son. Um, uh, it means the builder of name. Name also means authority in Hebrew. And this authority is really the will. So what we have is the father's will. So honoring your father and mother is to honor their will. And, and that means that just like in the Torah, the Torah is the will of Elohim, and uh, this is what he wants. And he gives that, and Mashiach honored his father and his mother by observing the Torah. That's their will. And just as he said, when you see me, you see the father. The reason that is is because he's doing the father's will. So what you're seeing isn't him and his own will. You're seeing the father's will. That's why you're seeing the father. And he said, I would that you were one with me, as I am one with the Father. So the big word there is as. How was Mashiach one with the Father? Well, it's because he obeyed him. Total obedience to his will, which was his Torah. He obeyed his will consistently and constantly. He did not vary from it. So this is how he wants us to be with him, the same way he is with the Father. Well, if he isn't his doing his will, but he's doing the will of his Father, and then... People say, well, they want to do Mashiach's will or Christ's will or all that. Well, that will, his commandments, when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. His commandments, right? If he's not doing his will, his commandments are the Father's commandments. So his commandments are the Father's commandments. If you love him, you'll keep his Father's commandments. You know, that's what that means. And so each son has a chance to either do the will of their father or not. And, and what Mashiach really teaches and taught was the outside, you know, he has many things where he talks to the, to the Pharisees and the religious leaders about the outside and the inside. 
And even though they were doing some things outside, they weren't doing some of the things inside. And there's really um, four categories of, uh, which is really three categories of measurement. One is the people who aren't doing the will, right? They don't have it inside or outside. They're not keeping the commandments. They don't have the fruit. They're a tree that bears, that doesn't bear the fruit, and it, it's cast down. Now, number two is, right, or, or, or the fruit that they're bearing is wickedness, right? Because what comes out of a man, right, is, is the fruit of what's inside them. So, so if they're wicked inside, they may do wickedness outside. That's the first type of person. The second type of person who's wicked inside, but they put this front on, this shell of perceived righteousness or restrain the actual wickedness that's inside them. This is the category that a lot of the Pharisees ended up in. Uh, they were outwardly righteous, but not inwardly keeping the law, right? Um, and this is why great example here is people who look for loopholes in the Torah. That ultimately is saying, I want to, uh, inside I don't want to keep the Torah, so i got to find a way to outside make it appear like I am. And so they rewrite. And number three is the person who's, so these are both, right? Outside have, have wicked fruit, then you know they're wicked. Outside has righteous fruit, then you're not sure if they're inside wicked or out, or inside righteous because the fruits can can appear one way and then there's the one that if the inside of the cup is clean the outside will be clean just like Mashiach said this is if you have the spirit of the Torah then you also have the fruit of the Torah so either one right if they if they bear no fruit then they're in trouble and if they if they say that they uh, as it says if they say they know me and keep not my commandments, they're a liar. There's no truth in them. Okay, so you get this concept where there is no category where you can just be a believer and not a doer. It doesn't work that way because all that proves is that you're not a believer. Um, because if you have the inside right, the outside will flourish and will prove it. You should be able to, as he says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. In other words... Someone can hand me a fruit, and I can tell you the tree it came off of. Well, that's an apple. That came off an apple tree. Okay? If if the fruit is disobedience to the Torah, then that does not come off of Mashiach, because he never disobeyed the Torah. His followers will not disobey the Torah. Okay? I don't even understand, I can't comprehend, how someone can say they're a follower of Mashiach who obeyed the Torah a hundred percent um and they say his, they're his follower and they don't obey the Torah you know that's an orange saying I'm an apple it doesn't work like that you know uh, according to Mashiach's words himself that's just not how it works he doesn't perf he being a keeper of the Torah does not produce fruit a violation of the Torah Okay, just like he said, many come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, he says, get away from me. I never knew you, right? It's a close relationship. In other words, you're not fruit on his tree. You who do lawlessness, it says, iniquity in some translations. It's the word lawlessness. You who break the Torah, I never knew you. Because he he doesn't know breaking the Torah. He never has. And, and so we see this concept of the judgment. Uh, this takes us right into the judgment of trees and and it's funny that Yitzhak it's kind of a curious thing Yitzhak says you know are you really my son Esau and and he says yes now it's funny to me because you have to wonder if Yitzhak knew something was up I mean every time he sees Esau does he say are you really Esau my son I mean does he really go through the check let me fill your hand let me kiss you. Does he do that every time he sees Esau? Or did he either know that that was Yaakov? Or at a minimum, he had to he had to wonder. He had to question if it was. So he wasn't totally blindsided. Like test after test, he does. This is judging the tree. He's looking at the fruit. He's looking at his own fruit, actually, because it's one of his sons. 
and he's examining the fruit. And this gives us the second pattern, that Elohim will examine the fruit of his tree. He will examine the men that say they're his sons to see if indeed they are his sons. Now what makes this interesting is that Ace, or Yaakov was not the firstborn, but he desired it. He got the inheritance and he desired the blessing. This reminds me of the Isaiah 56 stranger, somebody who wasn't in one position but just desired it even more than the person who was there who didn't really care about it that much. And we see this pattern repeating over and over in the Torah. And so he, an inside, right? If the inside is clean, then the outside shall be clean, right? Him to be a had, to be one, to really be that firstborn. This is a model of showing how somebody who wasn't the firstborn can become the firstborn. Why? Because he desired it. Um, he, he didn't steal it. Uh, Esau gave it up. He sold it to him. He's got a receipt. He has the birthright. And the blessing, I believe, follows the birthright. And I think that's why it went the way that it did. Because he had to put then the outside things to go with the inside. Now he had the birthright. So he now put on the outward things, right? This is like having bearing the fruit of the firstborn. So that's what it models. That he put on the garments, which are a model of righteousness, that the firstborn should have. So he's wearing Esau's clothes and he's doing all these things and ultimately he does get all of the blessing and the birthright. And this shows us the pattern that we can become sons of Elohim, not because we were, not because we deserved it, not because we were born into it, but because a man has two sons. A man has two sons is really about every son that is born. It means that your son can stop acting like their father. Your son can listen to an authority other than their father. They can follow a will that isn't the will of your father. That is a rebellious son. Any son who follows a will other than the will of his father is a rebellious son. The Torah says the rebellious son will not repent. Right? He does not do the will of the father. Should we put to death? And if you look at that, when you see that this models the Torah, the will of God is the Torah. So anybody who's not doing the will of God is sinning. The wages of sin is death. This pattern it fits within the pattern. And so what we see is that a man has two sons with every son that is born to him. He has a son that can be his son and honor him and do his will. And then he has a son that essentially goes the way of all these other sons, Cain, Yishmael, Esau, you know, Korok. You take any of these uh, people, um, any of these people who have chosen to do wickedness. They've chosen really just to not do the will of the Father. And when that happens, they don't, they're no longer a son. Um, not my will, but thy will. That is a motto of a son. And, and that is why we check ourselves. That's why we study Torah. We study Torah to know the will of the Father so that we can do it. So that we can do His will. And anybody who teaches you that the Torah or the Bible or anything else is about anything other than obedience to God, they are subtly, like the serpent, trying to lead you down another path. Right? The serpent talks to Hava and says, surely you won't die. First of all, let's remove the punishment. Right? Second, he says, actually, you know, this, he knew you were going to do this, you know, almost justifying that uh, it's a normal path to go down this road and to eat this. You're going to be like him. Um, and then all, all these things just justify the person doing what they want, not what God wants. Right? It's fulfilling that desire. It's having that bowl of porridge and uh, instead of honoring uh, your birthright. And uh, so we see this concept of this judgment of trees, this value of perceiving, is looking in ourselves and to saying, do I look like the fruit of the tree of life, right? Mashiach, the Torah. He is the word. He is the word of God. He is an example of 100% obedience to God. 
He represents the tree of God. He's the fruit of the tree of God. Therefore, within him is the seed, and and that's new life, right? And and also the outward fruit that surrounds the seed. See, that fruit has it all. And that fruit is a hod. It's one with the tree. It represents the tree effectively. You plant it in the ground, you're going to get more trees and more fruit. It's going to grow. That's why he says, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's to fully preach it, to make it full. That's the same thing as seed. A seed doesn't come to destroy the original tree. A seed goes in the ground and becomes even more trees and and more fruitful and and carries on just as the seeds actually as they found have have memory in other words seeds planted over time and in times of drought become more resistant and need less water to survive um, in the same way your children and those seeds become greater and greater more and more righteous so when we see that that Mashiach when we look at his fruit and his righteousness and he is that word of God and he's that seed that when he plants that seed in people who say they're his followers and his disciples they're supposed to get even more righteous not less that's going the wrong way so it's interesting this concept of a man has two sons in that um, we see that we each have the choice to be one of two sons just like those who said we're the seed of Avraham he said if you were Avraham's seed you would have Avraham's works well since we can choose our works it means we can choose just like the parable of the wheat and the tare whether we're the father or the sons of the wicked one or we're the sons of Elohim and it's an ongoing choice and Mashiach represents and represented when he was walking on earth a hundred percent obedience all the time and that's what he stood for that's what defined him and made him different than anybody else who kept some Torah he was the son of the living Elohim because he always kept the Torah. And that was our example as he says he was an example for us. So we get to the last part of the Torah portion, which is the wells. This is another example. All these patterns will just keep repeating themselves and showing the same thing. Fighting over the wells. The well is, water is the word of God. A well is a lot of times a teacher, so the well can represent Mishnah. And... Um, and what the Pelishtim did, and what these people did, is they filled it with earth, right? Well, the earth represents the literal, the surface stuff, and the water is what's underneath there representing the spirit. So when you see that what people have done to Mashiach, like even like Christianity, has just made him a man, just made him a, a concept, not, a, not something that can bring him uh, new life by teaching him the Torah and obedience, but just a means to an end. Uh, he survived salvation, he died on the cross, you know, they're just dancing in his blood, um, you know, rejoicing in his blood and his death, which to me is kind of offensive, really. I rejoice in his life. I rejoice in his living the Torah and what he did and the fact that he, he, he shed his blood for us. The blood belongs to Yodei Wahed is a valuable thing. It's not something to you know, to take uh, as uh, as uh, it says uh, in the Torah, it says it is better to obey than to sacrifice. You see, this comes to the base concept. Everybody loves Mashiach's sacrifice. They haven't figured out the greater values in his message of obedience. And uh, to be saved from your own sin is good only if you've repented and stopped sinning and grown in righteousness. Otherwise, if you return to your sin, you've murdered an innocent animal and you've offered an, a wasteful sacrifice. The sacrifice was for nothing because it didn't it didn't change the change you. It didn't compel you to be different. And and you know the only thing you can be different of when you were dealing with sin is to be righteous. That's the difference of sin. You've got sin on one side and righteousness on the other. And if all of a sudden you go, well, gosh, I know I'm just a horrible person and Jesus died for my sins. So you accept the sacrifice and then just stay the same person and keep sinning, which is the violation of Torah. Then what have you done? What have you done any greater than all of the other people who rejoiced at the death of this Jesus of Nazareth? Um, 
it, it is it is those who who were changed by it. When you have a sacrifice, it's supposed to change you. It's supposed to cause you to uh, stay in your repentance and never return to that sin again because you shed the innocent blood of of that sacrifice when it should have been you that was put to death. Uh, instead, you allowed payment from some somebody who was innocent and perfect for you, and, and that payment wasn't for nothing. It was with the expectation that you would be changed. You know, it, I, don't, I don't understand how the logic of a lot of people see that when they break it down, but the concept of fighting over these wells, we see the concept of fighting over the wells is that uh, people fight over Mashiach. People fight over what the Bible says. Um, people fill it with earth, which is like man's teachings and understandings. They just, you know, they take the 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 Bible and the God of Avraham, right? Avraham's wells, and they fill them full of earth. And there's some people go back and redid them. Like Yitzhak went and redug the wells of his father. That's like going back to the Torah and studying, and and getting to the spirit of obedience. And, and getting the spirit of the Torah and digging past all of the thoughts and foolishness of men who've clogged that up so that you can get to the refreshing word of God that refreshes your outside and your inside, your spirit. And um, it's interesting because really when it comes down to um, digging, right, the wells uh, or, or owning the wells, it, it's greater to dig the well. That's the Torah study. Because you'll 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 get to those wells, and eventually it's like got to the wells where they no longer fought over them. With. And uh, I can say probably maybe the reason why they didn't fight over it with would be because it ultimately came down to obedience. You know, who wants the well of requiring obedience? And everybody's like, ah, let him have that one. You know, we've got our salvation well over here. We've got our blessings, our eternal life, our promised land, our chosen people of God, our our are all these different th reasons why people get into religion and not all of them are to serve and to obey um, Yodei Wahe and be pleasing to him. That is a well that needs to be redug and I, I pray that we will do that um, and it's a small group of people working on that uh, with toothpicks <laughs> and, and there's many people with shovels who are digging the other wells that uh, are no wells at all. Um, so we see this um, this concept of fighting over the wells, and we see the same concept that with Asaph is that uh, Asaph owned the birthright, right? He owned the position. He sold the birthright, actually. He owned that firstborn position. Um, but in essential, essentially, it meant nothing at the end of this parashah because he, there was no blessing with it. There was no birthright. That came with it. So here he was in this position, but got nothing out of it. It was a waste. And that's the same thing as the tree with no fruit. Um, it, what good is it for? It isn't good for anything at that point. So being the firstborn didn't mean anything if you didn't if you didn't have the inheritance and, and the blessing and didn't act like the firstborn. If you weren't that beginning, the strongest essence of your father, then what was the point in you being first? And this is you know, a man has two sons. This is this concept that if you're going to be a son of Elohim, then it should mean something. Um, that you should not bring, uh, as, as the third commandment says, you shall not take his name in vain. To take your father's name and say, I am a son of Elohim, or I am a follower of Elohim, or a Mashiach, or whatever you want to say. If you say that, you better bring some meaning to that. Because if you are empty, if you are well filled with dirt, and then you say that, then you actually bring shame upon that. I mean, can you imagine? This is the well of Avraham, yet there's nothing in there but dirt. What are you saying about Avraham? You know, uh, to say you are a follower of Elohim and do not keep his commandments. It says, if they say they know me and keep not my commandments, they're a liar and there's no truth in them. That's just dirt. And the water coming out of that well. And so it's really important to understand that if you're going to be a son, you need to you need to act like a son. And if you're going to be a tree, if you're going to be from the tree of Elohim, then you need to bear that fruit. Who is my son? Uh, this is really desire meeting action. Your desire for God must be greater than your desire for sin, which is the momentary pleasures. It's the bowl of food that Esau ate. It's it's the revenge that Cain had. 
um, you know, it's like Mashiach said, who's my mother, who's my brother? Those who do the will of my father. You know, that says right there. You know, that is the story of Esau and Yaakov. Who was the firstborn? Who was the strongest um, son of Yitzhak? It wasn't Esau. And that was proven throughout the story. The son who really desired to be the greatest and the strength of the family was Yaakov. And thus, at the end of the day, he was the one who received all the blessings. It worked out that way. So that's the same way with the people of Israel. Um, there's many people who say they're Jews, who say they're the children of Israel, who say they're followers of God. All these words mean nothing. It's when your desire meets action, you can look at all of them and find the fruit that they do. If the fruit that they are doing is producing righteousness of Torah, that is the fruit. That is the same fruit Mashiach had. And that is the fruit of that tree. And you will know that tree by its fruit. And if they don't, it's just branches flapping in the wind. It's just people talking, all kinds of talk. But they are not those trees. They're talking about trees that they're not. They're saying, I am an apple tree. And there's either no fruit or there's oranges coming on there. And they're just not an apple tree. And... Um, so every, a man has two sons. It's just about measuring where we are in relationship to our, our words and our deeds. Are they true? Are they one? Are they echad? And are we echad with Mashiach? Because Mashiach was an obeyer of the Torah, 100%. I hope this message was a blessing to you. Don't let anybody uh, convince you uh, the Torah is not about obedience. Till next time, I'll say shalom.